this morning in reverence to God for the reading of our text. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Another parable put he forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner of the, uh, of the came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the time of harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. The title of my message this morning, Build Your House. Remain standing and bow with me for a word of prayer. Father, speak to us at DPC Church in a very personal way this morning. And I pray, Lord God, take us to where you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated if you plan on coming back tonight. <laughs> there are... Two things that God is dealing with in this passage of Scripture. One is harvest time and one is judgment. Now, there are a couple of questions that people have in these last days. And I'm just going to speak from my heart this morning. Can I do that? I'm not going to use any notes this morning. I, I have something very, very personal and special that I feel like the Lord wants to speak to this church body. So I want you to prepare yourself. Just open your spiritual ears to hear what God speaks to you this morning. Amen? There's a couple of questions that people have in these last days. And one, Pastor Josh, is, God, when are you going to send the last day harvest? And our hearts are overwhelmed with a desire to see DP, sir, D, DPC church filled to capacity and overflowing with people coming in and getting their heart right with God. Can I hear a big amen? And thank the Lord for the massive amount of people for, for the past seven plus years that have been coming in and getting their hearts right with God. Many of you got saved through this powerfully anointed ministry. and We have a desire to see that happen over and over and over. And we want to see people run the aisles and get their hearts right with God. Amen? And I'm thankful for what God has done through the ministry of Revival Fires as we have seen literally over the past 35 years of being full-time on the evangelistic field in uh, crusades in Cuba, crusades in Russia, India, Australia, and other places. We've had more than a million people give their heart to the Lord and get right with God. But I believe it's just scratching the surface compared to what God is in the process of doing right now. And so at DPC, we, want to, we say, God, when are you going to send the last day harvest? Another question that we have, that's one question. Another question we have is, God, why would you use unclean preachers who refuse to live right to build the kingdom of God? That's a question I've had for a lot of years. And because I want you to know that throughout history, there have been men and women of God that have been used mightily of God only for us to find out later that they uh, had a pattern of lying, had a pattern of, of, of uh, uh, drawing attention to themselves, having the spotlight syndrome, a, a pattern of, of uh, 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 having moral failure. And, and so we asked the question, God, wh where, what did I miss? I mean, why would you use somebody like that? And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. In the Bible... 
there were two men that were described. One was called the wise man and one was called the foolish man. So both men were told to go out and build a house because a storm was going to come. So first of all, I want you to look at the foolish man. Now this foolish man, he didn't like inconvenience, didn't like struggle. And, and so he went out and he built this beautiful home in record time on a faulty foundation. And for those of you sitting here that know anything about construction, you know that the most important part in building a structure is to be sure that the foundation is right. And in fact, I was traveling through South Louisiana and I came upon one of the most beautiful homes I'd ever seen in my life. And as I, I mean, this home was gorgeous. And as I approached the house, I noticed that there was a sign in the front yard. The sign said, house condemned, faulty foundation. You see, it didn't matter how beautiful that house was. It was empty and condemned and going to have to be torn down because the foundation wasn't right. Here's how it works. If the foundation isn't right, the whole house isn't going to be right. So here's this foolish man. He goes out and he builds this beautiful home in record time on a faulty foundation. Gets his electricity on. The lights are working. The water's running. He's probably got Wi-Fi and direct TV. I mean, this is a nice house. And he built this house in record time. And you notice that when he finished his house, the storm did not come immediately. The sun's still shining. So here's this this foolish man, he's probably sitting at his front screened-in porch, uh, just taking it easy. He's sipping Missouri tea and just having a good time. And he looks across the street and he sees what the Bible calls the wise man. And the wise man is building his house, but you know what? That wise man doesn't even have his walls up yet. You know why, don't you? He's still working on his foundation. So the wise man, he goes out week after week after week and the different elements of the weather, the hot blistering sun, the rain pouring down, the sleet, the snow. And you know there had to be days that that wise man would think to himself, is what I'm doing really necessary? I mean, here's this man across the street. He's built this beautiful home in record time and it just looks as though everything he puts his hands to seems to prosper. But hear me this morning, any house can look good any house can stand as long as no storm has come and the sun's still shining. You know how it is that right now America can be almost $29 trillion in debt and yet up until recently we looked like a prosperous nation? Because up until 911, no real storm had come to America. You know how it is that right now from the very year we took the Bible out of school in 1963, America has led the world in violent crimes, illiteracy, teenage pregnancy, illegal drugs, and the divorce rate, and yet, until recently, we've continued to look like a prosperous nation because up until 9 -1 -1, no real storm had come to America. You know how it is that right now, America can be res has been responsible for the millions and millions of unborn babies that have been murdered through abortion from 1973 all the way up to the present. And yet, until recently, we have continued to look like a prosperous nation because up until recently, no real storm had come to America. You know how it is that right now America on a federal level and a state level has put their stamp of approval on homosexual perversion and yet up until recently we have, we have continued to look like a prosperous nation? It's because up until recently no storm had come to America. Now in the story about the wise man and the foolish man, the foolish man looked wise and the wise man looked foolish. The foolish man is the one that, uh, the wise man is the one that put forth the extra effort, the extra time, and the extra money, and yet it looked as though everything the wise man was doing was unnecessary. You see, we're living in a day today in America where you can be considered a good Christian and yet breeze into church on Sunday morning and play a little church game and breeze back out and not be back in church any other time during the week and not get involved in a connect group or anything else. Give God a tip instead of a tithe. With our lips say that we love a God that we will not let him speak to us through his word. 
and say that we worship a God that we will not let him speak to us. We're living in a day in the American church today where you can be considered a good Christian and yet behave any way that you want to. You know why that is? It, the truth is, Pastor Josh, we've got a lot of spineless, jellyfish preachers in the pulpit today that are foolish men who will not preach the uncompromised word of the Lord because they're afraid if they do, then people in their church that have money will leave and not come back. But the day came when the wise man finished his house. He's exhausted. He's worn out. He's tired. But he finished his house. He hung his last roof shingle, hung his last door, hung his last window. He finished his house. Then God said, let the storm come. You know why God didn't let the storm come earlier? It wasn't because God changed his mind about sin. It wasn't because God looked down in a handful of our churches across America at some of our pastors that won't live right and that won't tell the truth. It's not because God looked down at those pastors that won't tell the truth and say, you know, lying used to be a sin, but now a liar is just somebody, an extrovert with a big imagination. Oh, no. It's not because God looked down and said, you know, stealing used to be a sin, but now a thief is somebody that has a creative financial ability. It's not because God looked down in America and said, you know, homosexuality used to be a sin, but now it's just an acceptable alternative lifestyle. I've changed my mind about that. Oh, no. It's not because God looked down in America and said, you know, abortion used to be a sin, but, and it used to be murder, but now it's just the sloughing off of a lifeless mass of tissue, and it's a woman's choice. Oh, no. Hear me this morning. Sin is not what I say it is, and sin is not what you think it is. Sin is what God's Word says it is, and that's what makes the Bible the most hated book in all of the world. So watch this. Do you know why God held back the storm? Because if He would have let the storm come earlier, not only would the foolish man have been destroyed... But the wise men would have been destroyed too. So God said, I'm going to hold back the storm, not because I love sin, but because I love the righteous man and I will not let him perish. God said, the storm is going to come and when it does, let the foolish man fend for himself. But God said, I'm going to hold back the storm to give the wise man time to finish building his house on the rock solid foundation. Hear me. The time of harvest has already been appointed by God. Jeremiah 5, 24. We'll put it on the screen. The Bible says, the Lord appoints the weeks of harvest. Now watch this. Harvest, according to our text, harvest and judgment are going to come at the same time. You remember in Noah's day, God was so sick of all of the sin that he saw that he had to repent for making man. There was no harvest. You see, we want harvest, but I believe the reason why God has held back harvest is out of mercy. Because when harvest comes, judgment comes, and judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Nowhere in the Bible does the Bible tell you to pray for the harvest. That is not in the Bible anywhere. The Bible tells you To pray for laborers. You know why the Bible doesn't tell you to pray for the harvest? Because the time of harvest has already been appointed by God. Hear me. Hell cannot stop harvest. The Bible says, as the water covers the sea, so shall the glory of the Lord cover the entire face of the earth. I believe we have focused, put our focus in the church as a whole in the wrong area. We have focused on harvest, but in reality, we should be focusing on relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear me. More important than you winning somebody to Jesus Christ is you having an intimate marriage relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have that kind of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then out of that relationship, 
you will automatically win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. You will automatically get involved in a connect group that has outreach. It's all about building your spiritual house on the rock-solid foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word house in the original Greek means habitation and temple. You know what the house is that you're building right now? And let me just say this. Everybody in this building listening to my voice and everybody watching by way of live stream, every one of you are building a spiritual house. The spiritual house that you're building right now is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't have an active prayer life and devotion time in the Word of God each day, then in that area of your relationship with the Lord, you're building your spiritual house on a faulty foundation. If you're not faithful to bring your tithe and give your offerings to the Lord's work, then in the area of your finances, you're building your house in that area on a faulty foundation. If you're not involved in a connect group to reach out to the community in that area of your relationship, you're building your house on a faulty foundation. Now understand, I'm not talking about salvation right here. I'm just talking about you building your house on a rock solid foundation. If you watch things on television or, or on the internet that you know are not pleasing to God, in that area of your life, you're building your house on a faulty foundation. If you're not faithful to the, come to the house of God, you are building your house in the area of church attendance on a faulty foundation. And there are those that will say, well, you know, Brother Todd, maybe I don't read my Bible and pray like I should, and maybe I'm not faithful to bring my tithe and give my offerings to the Lord's work, and maybe I watch some things on the Internet that I know are not pleasing to God, and maybe I don't do it all the way that I, you think I should. But the truth is, Brother Todd, I'm blessed. Look here. If you behave in a manner that is in opposition to the Word of God and you're blessed, all that means is the sun still shining. <laughs> Reversals have already begun to take place in the body of Christ. People that God has blessed with the ability to make money, and yet they won't use that money to build the kingdom of God, God is taking that money away from those people, and God is putting that money into the hands of people that will use it to build the kingdom of God. Preachers that won't live right and preach the uncompromised word of the Lord are finding themselves working in Circle K's and 7-Elevens and department stores and God is raising up some mighty men of God like Pastor Josh Palmer that will get in the pulpit, that will live right and get in the pulpit and preach truth and allow the Holy Spirit to move. Singers and musicians in the church that have a, the spotlight syndrome and want to draw attention to themselves instead of leading people into the presence of God. God is pulling the rug right out from under them and God is raising up worship teams like DPC that will lead people into the presence of God. In Noah's day, God was so sick of all of the sin that he had to repent for making man. Now listen, when you have to repent for making man, you've, got to, you've totally exhausted the mercies of God. You've totally exhausted the mercies of God. God said, I'm sorry that I ever made sin in the first place. He said, I'm going to destroy everything on the entire face of the earth. But then God looked down. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God said, I'm going to hold back the flood. Did he stop the flood? No. He just held it back. Why? The same reason why he held back the storm to give Noah time to build his ark. He said, so I'm going to hold back the storm to give Noah time to finish building his ark. So God gave Noah specific directions, instructions, told him exactly what to do and how to do it. But then the whole time that Noah worked on the ark, God did not say anything at all to Noah during that time frame. It was as though God was saying, 
No, I told you what to do, and I told you how to do it. I gave you specific instructions. Now do what I told you to do, and then we'll talk again. You know, God has already given you and me specific directions and instructions about how to live right here in the Word of God. You know what I mean by that, don't you? You don't need another prophetic word from a preacher to know whether or not you're living right. You've got the Word of God right here. So Noah went out week after week after week in the different elements of the weather working on that ark. And, and uh, I mean, don't you know he had to be exhausted? There had to be days that Noah would think to himself, have I really heard from God on this thing? I mean, uh, you've got to understand, Noah is in the middle of a desert and he's building an ark and it's never rained. He looked like an idiot. People would come by, they would laugh at him and scoff him and mock him, make fun of him. Then they'd go their own way and live their own life. I mean, there had to be days that Noah, exhausted, would have to question, have I really heard from God on this? But he continued to be faithful and do what God told him to do. Pastor Josh, thank you so much for being faithful to continue to do what God has told you and Pastor Jen to do in this community. The day came when Noah finished the ark. Those people had never seen lightning, never heard thunder, never seen the sky black with clouds. Y2K had come and gone and nothing happened. <laughs> 911 was a horrible terrorist attack, but things got back to normal. We've had problems in the economy. We had the pandemic, but now uh, we've, we, that's uh, subsiding. We've had uh, problems in the, uh, uh, in the economy and, and with inflation, and, but, but America's come through things like that before and, and we'll get back to normal. Noah's just a crazy old man and he doesn't know what he's talking about. God is not going to send judgment. But God had already set the appointed time of judgment. The next revival that we see take place in America has already begun. Listen carefully. It's not going to be a revival of healing. God has always healed. God's going to heal today. God will always heal. It's not going to be a giggling revival. The next revival that you see take place in our nation that has already begun is going to be a revival where God comes into every one of our church bodies and removes the tares. You know who the tares are, don't you? The tares are not the sinners, they're not the saints. They're the lukewarm churchgoers, they're the hypocrites. They're the people that take up space on the pew and suck up air conditioning. But they don't do anything to help build the kingdom of God. They just come in and take, take, take and don't give at all. Now, I'm not talking about finances, I'm talking about your whole life. God is going to remove the tares because it is going to be the righteous that bring in the last day harvest, not the tares. I've heard people say, oh, the worst day for the Christian is in front of us. That is not true. Psalm 37, verse 18 and 19. Now, certainly I believe the hardest times are in front of us. But Psalm 37, and verses 18 and 19 says, The Lord knows the days of the upright or the righteous and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. That's when where we're at right now. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. So I believe that in the worst days that we are approaching right now for our nation, it's going to be the greatest day for the church. Now, now that is not just... That is not just, to, let, me, let, me, let me back that up with the word of God. The worst day for the wise man was when the foolish man was prospering and the wise man was still working on his foundation. Because here's this foolish man. I mean, he's, he, he looks like he's blessed because no storm has come. So here's this foolish man. He walks by the wise man and he looks at him and he says, the foolish man says, why are you to the wise man? He says, why are you still working on your foundation? The foolish man says, I built my house quickly and, and I'm blessed. My house is beautiful. Why are you still working on that foundation? You should be done by now. It would be like this today. 
the foolish man would say something like this. Why are you getting involved in a connect group? That's not important for you to do that. The, the foolish man says, I'm not involved in a connect group and God's blessing me. Why are you working so hard on your foundation? The foolish man says, why are you being so faithful to bring your tithe and your offerings to the house of God? The foolish man says, I'm not paying my tithe or giving my tithe or giving my offerings and God's still blessing me. Why are you working so hard on your foundation? The foolish man says, why are you working so hard to pray and read your Bible and be faithful to the house of God and do what's right? The foolish man says, I'm not doing those things and God's still blessing me. Those were the toughest days for the wise man. When the foolish man was prospering and the wise man was still working on his foundation. But the day came when the wise man finished his house. And when he finished his house, then God said, let the storm come. When the storm came, the first thing that, this, that the storm hit was the foolish man's house. The Bible says, great was the fall thereof. So here's this wise man. He's looking out his picture window. He sees a wall of water coming full speed ahead and slams against the side of his house. But this wise man, he's not scared. He's not fearful. He's not afraid because he knows he built his house on the rock solid foundation. And the very same storm that was a damnation for the foolish man was the very same storm that was a vindication for the wise man. It wasn't this wise man's worst day. It was this wise man's greatest day because it let the whole world know that what he was doing by working so strong and so hard for that foundation, building it rock solid, was important and it was necessary. And those of you sitting here today that are involved in the connect groups, those of you sitting here this morning that you are doing what God has called you to do and you get exhausted because you look around and like you'll come to a prayer meeting and you'll see just a handful of people there and, and perhaps you, it, you, you get discouraged. I want you to know that God is looking at you and he's saying you're putting another hunk of rebarb in your foundation and when the storms come, your house is going to stand. You men in this house that get up early in the morning and you pray fervently for your family when hardly any men in America in the church are doing that today, I want you to know you're putting rock in your foundation and when storms come, your house is going to stand. You young people in this house, whenever all of the other young people are having sex outside of marriage, they're, having, they're, they're going to the keg beer parties, they're doing things that are not pleasing to God, and then they look at you living holy and upright and righteous, and the world, the young people that are wicked, they'll look at you and they'll laugh at you and they'll scoff you and mock you, but I want you to know God is looking at you and he's saying you're putting rock in your foundation, young person, and when the storms come, your house is going to stand. When the devil attacks DPC church, when the devil attacks this church body with the pandemic and with everything else, racial unrest and everything the devil is trying to do to the church in these last days and trying to divide, I want you to know that God is looking down at DPC church and he's saying, you're putting rock in your foundation and God said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. So in Noah's day, the flood came. When the flood came, I don't believe Noah was on that boat. Now understand, that was a horrible thing. That flood was a horrible thing. But Noah knew what he'd done. He'd done right. He, he did exactly what God told him to do. I guarantee Noah was not on that boat. 
chewing his fingernails, nervous and scared and saying, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Now we've got a flood. Oh, no. I believe Noah's on that boat with his hands lifted toward heaven saying, oh, God, I'm so glad I didn't listen to the seeker sensitive, but instead I allowed the Holy Spirit to move in our church body. I'm so glad I didn't listen to the hypocrite and the lukewarm churchgoer. But instead, I did what you told me to do. And I was faithful to go according to what you told me to do. So when God told Noah to build the ark, he said, when you finish with the ark, he said, then I want you to gather the animals. Clean seven by seven, the unclean two by two from every different denomination. Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Assembly of God. Church of God, Pentecostal Church, all of them. You got to understand that by now, Noah, and get him on the boat. Noah's 600 years old. He's, he, I mean, he's got to be worn out. He's tired. He's an old man. But God had a surprise for Noah. I believe Noah's in the bottom of that boat making last minute inspections. And I believe that one of his sons... I can use my practical imagination. I, I can see one of his sons come to him and say, Dad, something really crazy is going on outside with all these animals. You need to come out here and see what it is. Noah gets to the opening of the boat and he sees every species of animal in a single file headed for the ark of God. Nobody has, nobody has enticed them with food. The animals, nobody's lassoed them. Nobody's tricked these animals. God changed the beast nature of these animals and they're headed for the ark of God. And Noah says, Noah says, God, you knew after working so hard and so long to build this ark exactly the way that you told me to build it, to do what you told me to do. You knew that after getting all of that done, I would just be too tired and exhausted to gather these animals up. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with, these, with this. God says, Noah, you did what I told you to do. You built the ark. Now I'm going to fill it up. Look, I'm thankful that this house is full. But listen to me. More important than you building, having a, a, a house that's full is to be sure that you have built your house on the rock-solid foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is all about building your spiritual house on the rock-solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Now listen, I'm thankful for all of the bells and whistles that we have, but the, the ingredient that when hard times takes place in America, the ingredient that people are going to be looking for when they're in trouble is not whether or not we have lights or anything in the house. It's going to be the presence of God. And this church body, Destiny Point Church, has been building their spiritual house on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So whenever hard times, you say, oh, we've already had hard times. I don't believe it's anything compared to what's getting ready to happen. But again, I'm not saying that negatively. I'm saying that in the midst of hard times, God's people are going to be blessed. And the presence of God flowing mightily at Destiny Point Church. And when people find themselves in trouble in Columbia, guess where they're going to come to? They're going to come to this house right here because the presence of God resides at Destiny Point Church. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes and open your hearts. And I want to ask AJ if you'll come and just softly begin playing whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to play. I believe that there are some of you sitting here this morning that you're not in right relationship with the Lord. I want you to know Jesus loves you just the way that you are. Now with nobody looking around, if I could have the prayer team, if you will, to come to the front and just line up across the front here if you would please nobody looking around every head bowed every eye closed and every heart wide open I believe the message has gone forth this morning not from man's lips but from God's lips I have poured my heart out to you and shared with you what the Holy Spirit asked me to share 
there are those of you watching by way of social media right now that really you've been building your spiritual house on a faulty foundation Jesus loves you and he's ready to wash your sins away today right now there are those of you in this sanctuary right now that your life is not in right relationship with God Jesus is ready to forgive you there's nothing to fear when you're in right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and he's ready to forgive you this morning now if you're in this building this morning you'd say brother Todd I'm here this morning but I realize as I search my heart my life's not really in right relationship with God it may be that at one time you served God but as you search your heart you realize you're not really in right relationship with the Lord you say, but I want to be in right relationship with the Lord. I want you to know that Destiny Point Church is ready to wrap their arms of love around you and to love you and to help you get to where you need to be with God. But the first thing you need to do is surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's ready to forgive you. No strings attached. He's ready to forgive you and take you just the way that you are. Please understand, Jesus does not want you to get straightened out and come to Him. Jesus wants you to come to Him just like you are this morning, just like you are. And He's going to help you get straightened out. He's going to help you.